soul question. Should you pop your pimples? You've probably noticed that your skin is covered in pores. The teeny tiny little openings around hair follicles that let liquids and gases seep through your skin. One of the main things that comes seeping out of your pores is a special oil called sebum. It sounds gross, but the oil actually helps to keep your skin and hair from drying out, like natural moisturizer. Most of the time, our body makes the right amount to keep us moisturized without overloading us with oil. But not always. Sometimes, dead skin cells start to stick together and clog up one of those pores, causing the oil to slowly build up. Bacteria starts to grow and multiply inside the pore, making it swell and turn red. That's usually when we first notice a problem. According to experts, there are three basic types of blemishes. Blackheads, whiteheads, and the one that sounds by far the ickiest. Pustules. Ugh. Blackheads are pores that are open and clogged up with oil and dead skin cells. The stuff that's been exposed to air dries out to a blackish color, hence the name. Whiteheads are also full of the same stuff, but the pore is completely blocked off by the skin cells, causing it to bulge out into a bump. Pustules are the deepest type of pimple and the hardest to get rid of. They're usually red, inflamed, and even painful. As a general rule, you should never try to pop your own pimples. I know, I know, it's hard to resist. But experts agree that you're almost always better off waiting for the pimple to run its course rather than trying to speed things up. Well, that's easy to say when you don't have a big blemish on your face, but it really is true. Popping might seem like a simple way to get rid of a pimple, but it doesn't always solve the problem. Pimple popping can damage your skin and cause permanent acne scarring. It can also restart the healing process if the pimple was popped before it was ready. So instead of being a quick fix, it actually can make a pimple last longer. Instead, the best thing you can do is wash the pimply skin twice a day, try to avoid touching it, and let your body do its thing. Because eventually, the clogged pore will burst on its own, clearing away the bacteria so the skin can heal naturally. Sometimes, pimples can get so bad that they form painful acne that won't go away no matter how much you wash and take care. In that case, a doctor may be able to give you medication to help clear things up. So, should you pop your pimples? Eh, probably not if you can manage to avoid the temptation. Cause truth is, that's usually a lot easier said than done. So, if you're gonna start popping pimples, at least try and squeeze with caution. Why do onions make us cry? Human beings have three distinctly different types of tears. Emotional tears, basal tears, and reflexive tears. Emotional tears are maybe the most memorable type of tear. They're the kind we cry when we're hurt, upset, or emotionally stressed. Cutting up onions doesn't cause emotional tears, unless you're particularly passionate about root vegetables. Basal tears don't run down your cheeks like emotional tears. They're more like a protective layer of liquid that always covers your eye. Every time you blink, your eyelid covers your eye with a new basal tear. That's why your eyes would dry out if you stopped blinking. But basal tears don't have much to do with why we cry when we cut up onions. So that just leaves us the third kind of tear, reflexive tears. Our eyes well up with reflexive tears whenever other outside particles get in your eyes. This is usually caused by things like dust or wind, pollen, smoke, smog, and, oh, you guessed it, onion vapors. Okay, so now we know what type of tears makes us cry over onions, but why? What about onions irritates our eyes enough to make us tear up? Well, when you cut into an onion, you're slicing through the onion cells, which causes chemical reactions inside the broken cells. That reaction causes a gas to form that's irritating to the eyes of most humans. The irritation causes the brain to send reflexive tears to your eyes, and voila, you're crying while cutting up onions. What's so funny about the funny bone? 
that funny feeling you get when you bump your elbow is all about a nerve called the ulnar nerve that runs from your neck all the way down to your hand. Almost all of the ulnar nerve, like the rest of the nerves in your body, is protected by bones, muscles, or ligaments. But as the ulnar nerve makes its way across your elbow, there's a spot where it's only protected by fat and skin. Any time that it feels like you hit your funny bone, you're actually pressing the ulnar nerve against the bones in your elbow, squishing it. That shooting, weird, tingling pain shoots all the way through your ulnar nerve, which is why you can feel it from your fingertip up to your neck and shoulder. So why do they call it the funny bone? Well, many people think it's because the name of the bone in the arm that the nerve squishes up against is called the humerus bone. Get it? Humerus? Humor? Funny? <laughs> Anyway, it's way less funny if you have a condition called cubital tunnel syndrome, where it feels like something's hitting your funny bone all day and night. Yup, cubital tunnel syndrome happens when the ulnar nerve gets pinched or squeezed at the unprotected spot on the elbow that causes the tingling pain. In severe cases, your fingers can even start to curl up from the nerve pain, which is called the ulnar claw. Ugh, well, I guess it's not so funny when it happens to you. Why does helium make your voice sound funny? In order to understand how helium makes our voice sound so strange, we'll have to learn the basics about how our voice works. Every person's voice starts in a little organ in our necks called the larynx, or more commonly, our voice box. Your larynx, or voice box, contains vocal cords, which are muscles that stretch across the larynx like rubber bands. Think of them like guitar strings. Every time you speak, you're pushing air from your lungs through your vocal cords. This causes them to vibrate, which is what makes the sound we call our voice. When we speak, the air we're pushing through our lungs is, well, just normal air. 78% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, and 2% other stuff. But helium is a lot lighter than nitrogen or oxygen. That allows sound to travel more than twice as fast through helium than it does through normal air. When you breathe in a heaping helping of helium, that fast air makes your vocal cords vibrate faster than normal. And just like guitar strings, if your vocal cords are vibrating faster, that means your voice gets higher. In small amounts, helium is usually harmless and almost always hilarious. But breathing in boatloads of the gas is a pretty bad bet. Each time you breathe in helium from a balloon, you're not breathing in oxygen, which means that your lungs and blood aren't getting the fresh oxygen they need. So if you keep on breathing in only helium, the lack of oxygen over time could lead to brain injuries or even death. But despite its dangerous demeanor, helium is actually a highly important element used in all sorts of high-tech ways. Scuba gear, MRI machines, lasers, nuclear reactors, rockets, and even our smartphones are just a few of the futuristic modern-day gadgets that rely on our old friend Helium. I guess that's why you'll always be our number one element. Well, number two, technically. Why do most girls have higher voices than boys? In order to answer this question, we need to understand how speaking works in the first place. How high or low your voice sounds depends on the size and shape of your vocal cords. Vocal cords are muscles in the back of your throat that stretch like rubber bands across your voice box, called a larynx. Every time you talk, you push air out of your lungs and through your vocal cords. This causes them to vibrate really fast, which makes a sound. Think of it like strings on an instrument. The vibration of a guitar string is what makes sound, and the tighter and smaller you make the string, the higher it sounds. That's why ukuleles are smaller and higher pitched. So, just like guitar strings, the shorter and thinner your vocal cords are, the higher your voice sounds. That's why people have higher voices when they're young and deeper voices when they age. Their vocal cords are getting bigger. As boys get older, their bodies release a hormone called testosterone that helps them grow fast and causes their vocal cords to grow thick and long. Girls also start to produce testosterone, just not nearly as much as boys. So their voices get a little deeper as they age, but usually not as deep as boys. So now that you know how your vocal cords work, try playing with the pitch of your voice. When you talk in a low voice, you're squishing your vocal cords down to make them thicker. And when you talk in a high voice, you're stretching them out like a rubber band to make them nice and thin. Pretty cool, huh? And now you know... 
And now you know why most girls have higher voices than boys. Why does it feel so good to scratch? There's lots of different things that can cause your skin to itch. Allergies, rashes, and bug bites are obvious culprits. But almost any itch is caused by a simple thing. Irritated skin cells. That's right. Whenever your skin cells are irritated, they send signals to your brain that say, hey, pay attention to this spot. And we call that sensation an itch. Okay, so that's what causes us to itch, but there's still one more question. If feeling itchy is unpleasant, why does it feel so good to scratch an itch? Well, as it turns out, scratching an itch doesn't actually feel good. It's just a mental trick. You see, whenever you get an itch, your brain tells your body to block the itchy sensation by scratching it. Doing so actually causes pain, just like any other scratch would. So in order to stop that new pain, your body releases something called serotonin which is a feel-good hormone in the body that helps relieve pain. Once the scratching stops and the itch goes away, the serotonin stays inside your system. And since serotonin really just likes to have a good time, it sends signals back to your brain that say, hey, it was actually pretty fun scratching that itch. That can trick your brain into actually feeling a phantom itch sensation again, starting the cycle all over again. So to recap, first you feel an itch sensation. Then you scratch, which causes a little bit of pain. That releases serotonin to control the pain. That serotonin sticks around, sometimes causing your itch to return. Or in other words, the body is super weird. Why are only some people double jointed? Despite the fact that people often say they're double jointed, it turns out there's actually no such thing. That's right, it's all a sham. Well, kind of. You see, the term double-jointed implies that some people have some kind of extra joint that allows them to really bend and twist their bones into awkward positions. But the truth is, that's just not possible. No one out there has extra special joints that lets them bend their arms, fingers, or other limbs into strange poses, no matter how flexible they might seem. Okay, so then... What's the deal? Why can some people really bend their joints all around while others really can't? Well, turns out what we think of as being double jointed is actually called hypermobility syndrome. For most of us, it hurts to stretch our joints beyond their normal range of motion. But for people with hypermobility, there's little or no discomfort at all, allowing them to contort their bodies in ways that makes most of us cringe. So that's why some people can bend their joints so much, but how? What actually causes people to have hypermobility? Well, most joints inside your body are held together by ligaments that connect bone to bone and tendons which attach your muscles to your bones. Usually, we all have about the same range of motion in our joints, but if you have extra flexible ligaments wrapped around them, you can bend and twist around extra far. There are also people who have hypermobility for a different reason the shape of the joint. This usually happens in a ball and socket joint like the shoulder. The shallower the socket, the more give there is for the ball to move around. For some people, the ball can even slide out of the socket completely, allowing them to essentially dislocate their bone purposefully and painlessly. Just, you know, careful who you pull that one in front of, because it might not be painless for everyone. Why do people have different blood types? In case you didn't know, there are four main blood types. Type A is the oldest and even existed before humans. Blood types B, AB, and O were all formed by genetic mutations over millions of years. Your blood type can also be positive or negative based on whether your blood has an extra protein in it. So that means, all in all, there's eight distinct blood types. A positive, A negative, B positive, B negative, AB positive, AB negative, O positive, and O negative. Over 70% of people have either A positive or O positive blood. Blood types are super important because if you ever need a blood transfusion, getting the right type can literally mean life or death. 
You see, your blood is really good at fighting off cells that aren't supposed to be there. And that includes blood cells of a different type than your own. If you get an infusion with the wrong blood type, your body will go into defense mode and destroy the brand new blood cells. This can make you sicker and can even lead to death. But that doesn't necessarily mean some blood types can't mix. Type A blood doesn't mix with B, so getting type B or AB blood is bad news. But you'd be perfectly fine with type A or O. The same goes for type B. It doesn't mix well with type A, so people with type B blood can only receive type B or O. Type AB blood has it good because they can receive any blood type, A, B, AB, or O, and be totally fine. Type O is known as the universal donor because you can give it to anyone with any blood type. That makes them great for giving blood, but it also means they can only receive type O. Okay, so all that begs the question, why do humans have so many blood types? Well, researchers don't know for sure, but it seems the main reason is to fend off disease. For instance, people with type O blood are much less likely to get malaria and suffer from its symptoms. And that blood type is very widespread in areas like Africa where malaria is common. People with type O blood are more likely to get the bubonic plague, and people with type A blood are more likely to get smallpox. So since areas like China, India, and Russia have had major outbreaks of both diseases, they have lots of people with type B blood. So does it really matter much what blood type you have? Nope, not really. The only time in life that your blood type really matters is when there's experts there to help.